Hey home bakers, it's Jack here, bakewithjack.co.uk, bringing you your weekly bread making tip every single Thursday. And if you watched last week's video, you'll know exactly what I'm gonna say next. Roll it! Hey you guys and welcome back to the Bake With Jack YouTube channel where I share with you a little bit of my bread making expertise every single week. And you may have noticed last week's video on sourdough questions, your sourdough questions to be specific. I did my very best to answer as many of your questions as possible, but that video is getting so long I had to split it into two Part. So let's resume. Here's part two, cut to me, cut to Jack of the past with slightly longer hair and a little bit more of a mess. See ya. Next question from Tracy Moore. Do I determine how much sourdough as a percentage like the hydration level? Yes, you can determine all ingredients as a percentage if you want to. I never do. Uh, I tend to stick it, uh, to stick to the same quantities for a loaf of bread, which I'll explain in a minute. You can do everything in a percentage. In a lot of recipes you see, everything is a percentage. Salt, moisture, flour is obviously 100%. Uh, sourdough starter is all a percentage, but however, when working out the hydration of the whole loaf as a whole, I'll include the moisture in the starter. Making the starter, flour and water, adding it to the other flour and water in the recipe, working out the hydration of the whole thing to get the hydration percentage. But no, not necessarily, I don't really, um, Everything is a formula at the end of the day. Everything can be a formula if you work it out in percentages, which is really, really cool. Cats come back in. Uh, but I don't tend to, that doesn't really become of any use to me, I must admit. Folk Wig says, how do you calculate the amount of sourdough starter in a recipe? Say I have 100 grams of starter in my fridge and I wanna bake. I remove 50 grams to bake with how much water or flour do I need to feed it? And once it's active and ready for baking, how much bread can I make with it? Okay, uh, this completely depends on your recipe. Some recipes will use 20 grams of starter, some recipes use 150. I used to use 150 in the olden days and now I use 100 because it's nice and manageable for me. 100 grams for a loaf of bread. 100 grams of starter. What I would do is remove almost all of your starter out of your pot and just leave the scrapings. You can watch my video, it's called 71, called Sourdough, the Scrapings Method. Guy Kaminsky says, when baking 100% whole rye sourdough breads, I always get very sticky crumbs. Yes, you will, because it's 100% rye, that's the deal. It's 100% rye, it's a real sticky crumb. Bake it for longer than you would do a regular bread, and also let it rest overnight. Let it rest, let the moisture settle out until tomorrow before you cut it. That's a very important thing. All breads should rest when they come out of the oven until they're cool, but rye needs overnight, really, for that moisture to settle out. There doesn't seem to be a lot of recipes for spout sourdough bread. Have you got any tips for handling this king of flour? Yes, never make a loaf with 100% white spout flour. It's really difficult to manage and I feel like 100% white spout flour is a little bit of a flawed concept. You need the wholemeal in spout flour. You need the wholemeal to hold the structure together. I do a couple of loaves, 100% wholemeal spout flour. Yes, it is heavier, uh, but it's really, really yummy and completely doable. Cut down the moisture perhaps because it's more extensible than it is elastic -y. It's got more extendability than it has a snapback, if you like, uh, in the final dough. Um, that's what I would do. Anton Rees says, I make only 70% whole wheat sourdough and I do find it difficult to get consistently good loaf. Why is it artisan bakers avoid whole wheat sourdough? Well, they do around here anyway. Okay, whole wheat sourdough, 100% whole wheat sourdough will be quite on the heavy side. It has its place, but it's probably niche. Maybe it doesn't, affect, uh, maybe it doesn't appeal to the public, it's totally doable. Maybe it just doesn't appeal to public sales. Maybe people don't want that sort of bread. Maybe there's only a few handful of people that actually do. Uh, consistency is down to a lot of things. It's down to practice, 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 practice to get the consistency you need. It's probably not the flour, it's probably some other factor, how long you left your starter out, but I find consistency is a tricky thing. The thing to do is to learn about the process so you can adapt what you're doing uh, to what your dough does on the day, if that makes sense, and there's not too much of a cop out. Guy Kaminsky again says, what size of banneton do you recommend using for a two pound loaf? Here is the banneton I use for a two pound loaf. It is 30 centimeters long, 16 centimeters wide, and eight centimeters 
deep. A two pound dough is roughly about 920 grams, I think, which is almost a kilo. And this is sold in a one kilo Banneton basket. I think that's how it's advertised. A one kilo of dough Banneton basket. 30 centimeters, 16 centimeters, eight centimeters. Wayne Kay says, I've heard many people talk about how many percents, usually 20 to 50%, the dough should rise during the bulk. How do I measure it? The answer is, don't bother. Keep notes on your sourdough progress. This thing isn't here just for a giggle. It's here because I literally write down everything. I write down the temperature on the day. I write down the hydration. I write down how my loaf came out at the end. I write everything down. And these days, we all got telephones to take pictures of stuff. Take a picture of your dough when it's puffed up. Bake it, see how it comes out, write down the result. Try it different next time, right? This is all a learning process. Try not to compare it to other people. 20% rise, 50% rise. I literally have no idea what all that means. What I do know is that this is looking puffy and healthy and I'm going to put it in the oven and it's going to look lovely. And the reason I know that is because I've practiced and because I know this is looking healthy and lovely and it's going to come out lovely. That's it. Practice. But practice is pointless if you don't remember your practice. I always think to myself, oh, I remember how I did that for next time. I don't remember how I did that for next time. Take a pencil, get yourself a nice notebook and write it down inside exactly what happened. If you really want to learn and you're rather keen, that's what you need to do. Holy smokes, are you still here? Uh, next one, Ayunki Cho, oh, man, I'm so sorry, says, I often seem to end up over kneading the dough while seeking the stage of cleanup with better slash satisfactory tension. I tried to follow your recipe, sourdough loaf for beginners. The thing is, after the auto lies in the 10, 12 folds, my dough wouldn't form into a ball. Far from it. That's why I end up overworking the dough, I think. Okay. I wonder if this is the case of actually overworking the dough or maybe just sort of breaking the structure, which I did talk about briefly in the video that I did that is a yeasted dough, in fact about why is my dough still sticky? It's a similar principle, I think. And this is what happens in classes sometimes, is that uh, when you're folding it up, you, you have to uh, go with the tension that your dough has. When you, let's say, for example, you turn your dough out upside down. You do your first fold, everything's real nice and extensible. You can pull it out nice and fold it over nicely. Turn it and do the same. Keep folding your way around. And as you go around, tension is building. You'll be able to grab less and less dough as you go along. And that's okay as long as you adapt what you're doing. Don't continue to stretch it out too far. What I see people do sometimes is continue trying to stretch it really far and bringing it over the top of itself and therefore ripping the outside of the dough and turning it into a big sticky mess. Dust one side of your dough, that's the top, flip it upside down and fold it up, adjusting what you're doing to the tension of the dough until you get a nice ball. Don't overstretch it and tear it. I feel like that's probably what you're doing. Next question is, I use 100% rice starter when it seemed to be excited, like doubled in volume, I would put a spoonful in a glass of tap water for a float test and it always synced. Thinking it wasn't ready yet, I would wait for an hour or two and then the starter seemed to have gone past its peak. Does rice starter ever float? This is the deal breaker. Listen to this, are you ready? Something's definitely wrong with mine and I don't know what it is. Thanks. Nothing is wrong with your starter. If it doubled in size, you already won the game, right? It's creating gas and increasing in volume. That's it, you won the game. Don't stress out about floating it on water. Like in theory, it'll have so much gas in it that it will float on the water. There's nothing wrong with it. It's puffing up, it's increasing in volume. That's exactly what your bread needs to do. And that's exactly what your starter will do for your bread. Don't stress out about the non-floating thing. I, I literally never do it ever. Okay, questions are getting long now. I appreciate your stamina. If you're still with me for this amount of time, then uh, good for you, because uh, like we're all struggling now, okay? But we're in this together, let's get through it. Deb, B6236 says, Hi Jack, I made my first sourdough with starter from a friend that I didn't know how to take care of the starter, and it ended up with a hooch, which I poured off and then kept feeding the starter. Turns out, the bread I made from that starter had the most amazing sour taste, which is what I love in sourdough. My problem is, since then, my starter, now that I know how to feed it, has not produced the same amount of tangy sour taste in breads I've made since. How do I get that tang back? Okay, perhaps the tang is in that hooch. I don't know. I never get it, but this is what I think is happening. If you had extra liquid in your starter in the beginning to then make that hooch, and then you pour it away and feed the starter, your starter is thicker, right? The hydration is lower. In a wet starter, it develops flavor and it develops that acidity faster. Wet starters move faster than drier 
starters. And I think that's probably why it was acidic in the beginning, because it was more fast moving, developed more acidity in a less amount of time. If you're doing the same recipe with a starter now that's less wet, maybe at the point you're catching it, it's less fermented than it was in the beginning. Josh Fairweather 7 says, my sourdough never rises when I prove it in the fridge overnight, but it is fine when I let it rise at room temperature. Could this be that the fridge is too cold or other other factors to consider? In my recipe, the dough is always rising. It's always rising all the way through a six-ish hour uh, bulk fermentation stage, the pre-shape and the shape. And then I leave it on the side about 40 minutes or so, and then I put it in the fridge where it rises the Difference in size is minimal when I put it in the fridge or when I take it out of the fridge. It's already done that major puff. It's already really excited and full of gas already. And then I put it in the fridge and then it goes and stalls itself up and doesn't really grow much. What does happen is it seems to dome off. It seems to plump up. It doesn't grow in size much because it's in the cold. And that's great because we can literally leave it there for ages. So what I would suggest is maintain the gas over the whole process as much as possible, being as gentle as you can with the dough. Then shape it, leave on the side, half an hour, 45 minutes, let it puff up, bang. Put it in the fridge. Do not expect excess growth in the chill of the fridge. The next question, rather conveniently, Dan Star 7 says, how long can I store it in the fridge? This one I made on Sunday afternoon, and now on the filming of this video, it's Wednesday afternoon. So that is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's 72 hours I'm about to bake it, because I don't want to turn the oven on now, because you'll hear it. I'm about to bake it at the end of this filming. That's 72 hours later, and you know what? Flavour develops over that time. Bake it when you need to. Bake it when you can. 24, 48, 72 hours. I think it's gonna be okay. Andrew 12 says, no, all these numbers, oh! <laughs> all the numbers I've been reading is uh, how many hours ago? Andrew 12 hours ago, what a numpty. Andrew says, hi Jack, my questions are, how does the amount of initial starter I use affect the end result of my bread? I assume the more starter I use, the more sour my bread will be, not necessarily. But does that also mean that using more starter, my bread will rise faster? How will it affect the end outcome of a baker sourdough bread? Loaf, baked sourdough bread loaf. Okay, the more starter you use, the quicker moving your sourdough will be because what's happening is the yeast is multiplying over time. I covered that in another video before. Yeast multiplies over time. If you start with more, uh, it's gonna multiply like more over amount of time. Does that make sense? So yes, it will be faster moving. In my experience, you don't get more sourness that way. You get more sourness when there's less uh, fast mover, when it's a slower moving dough. It takes more time for it to firm and you get more sour flavour, more complexity of flavour developing over time. As a result of that time, you get a more moist crumb texture. Uh, it depends what you want out of the final loaf. The game changer is time and the way that you manipulate the time is by temperature or the amount of starter that you use. Does that even make any sense? I don't know. Let's move on. One final question. Question number 29 from Jill Cocker says, when shaping, if you manage to break the thin dough skin, is there any way of repairing and saving the loaf? I've had it a few times where I've built too much tension on the non-stick side or been a bit too forceful and caused a small area of the half-shaped batard to become sticky. Okay, yes, you want to keep that skin intact. Just be gentle with it. I find if it does break, if I go a little bit too far, I let it rest up for a little bit longer and then try again. Leave it on the side for half an hour or so and then try again. And it should bring that smoothness, that tautness back to the skin, almost creating a new skin as that then crack dries out, if that makes sense. Sometimes those are completely unmanageable. They're sticky to the point where you can't literally do anything with it, and that's because of over-fermentation. If you leave it too long, everything turns into this untamable jelly mess, and that stickiness will never go away. If that's where you're at, that might have happened a couple of times on a warm day, for example, that's a real shame. There's not a lot you can do about that, apart from incorporate that then dough into a new dough to save wasting it but in terms of saving a patch let it sit up rest up and then try and reshape it one more time oh my goodness there you go 29 of your salvador questions answered i hope it helps i do not proclaim myself to be the expert who knows everything about sourdough bread but i hope what i've told you is very very helpful thank you to everybody who sent me a question sorry to you guys that i didn't answer it because 
I can't, it's so hard. I see my, in my inbox, I see my Instagram questions, my YouTube questions, and I can't get there anymore and answer them all. It's really playing on my mind, and I apologize if you were hoping for an answer and I couldn't answer it this time, but you know what? There will be bread making tips off into the future that will hopefully help you out on your quest for amazing bread at home. Well, there you have it. This has been video bread tip number 99. So many of you sent me your questions, 70 in fact, up to the time when I recorded, it's probably more now. I answered 29 out of 70 and I think that's pretty good going. Well done if you're still here at this point of the video. I always feel like a little bit of a cop out when I say this, but I feel like the answer, the actual answer to all of these questions in part two and part one is practice. Try it. If you wanna know what effect more or less starter has on your sourdough bread, try it. If you want to know how different breads are, if you bake them on the day, the following day, or the next day, try it. Make two loaves, bake one 24 hours later, and bake the other one 48 hours later. Practice, practice, practice. Practice is the most powerful thing. Your most powerful tool is to build an understanding. Watching my videos here and practicing at home, which leads me quite nicely onto video number 100. Next week is video number 100. I'm gonna take a little bit of a different slide to video 100, and I hope that's okay. If you like it, you like it, and if you don't, you don't. I feel like what will then happen is there might be a little week break between 100 and 101, and 101 will be your practical one. It will be a recipe start to finish, so keep your eyes peeled on the community tab. I'll pop a poll there. Uh, to see which sort of recipe you'd like to see and I'll do my best to bring that to you. Number 101. I look forward to seeing you next week for another bread making tip. Number 100. Can you believe it? I'll see you then. Bye bye. Well there you go. If you're still here, well done for soldiering on. I hope you got something out of this week's video and last week's in fact. And don't forget if there's any bread making bits and bobs, scrapers and cloths you need to pick up the Bakery Jack shop is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, bakewithjack.co.uk forward slash shop. Shipping worldwide. See you next week.